Welcome to the Fuzzy Mike, the interview series, the podcast, whatever Kevin wants to call it. It's Fuzzy Mike. Hello, and thank you for joining me. Today's episode is how to heal from emotional hurt. And my guest is Kamia Deadweiler, an author and survivor of extreme childhood trauma. But before we welcome Akamia, I want to share something with you. I received a lot of compliments on my episode with David Shamzad that talked about overcoming an attempt of suicide. Yeah, there was one comment, quote, I don't need to hear this shit, from someone who didn't use a name. And frankly, I'll never understand the motivation or purpose behind such a message. If you don't like something, turn it off and go about your day. Constructive criticism? Yes, share that. I'm all about getting better. Anything less, though, well, go fuck yourself. There was one comment that was direct messaged to me, and it drove home one of the reasons that I do this podcast and why I have a concentration on mental health episodes. I host this podcast because I love the art of the conversation. And when I'm talking with a guest, I get to practice that art. And at the same time, I get to learn about fascinating people. I host this podcast because as an early retiree, I have a lot of free time. And this helps me fill that time so that I don't occupy my mind with self-loathing and harmful thoughts. When I post mental health episodes, I do it because I like creating open dialogue on a topic that some see as weakness. I appreciate learning new ways of coping with my own mental issues. And I also do it in the hope that if someone is struggling, they can listen to the fuzzy mic and maybe get an answer they're looking for or motivation to seek help or make change on their own. This is a message I got from Brenda and she granted me permission to use her story and her name. She wrote, hi, Kevin Klein. I just wanted to let you know about your last podcast you posted on Fuzzy Mike. That show touched very close to home. I am a suicide survivor. When I was 18, I was beaten and raped by someone that I thought truly cared about me. When all this happened, I really and truly thought everything was over. It's hard for me to get back to the happy-go-lucky self. I still have good and bad days and sometimes rough weeks when I think things aren't going right. I also have those days when I just want to give up on everything. But now I can step back and see what I have to live for. I wasn't supposed to see 30, but I will be 44 this year. I mean, I think I'm doing good. So again, thank you for your podcast this week. Brenda, thank you for sharing your story. And I am so happy that you're doing good. Maybe you'll find something in this episode that you can use to continue your personal growth. Here's how my guest, Akamia Deadweiler's personal story begins. I don't want to be 60 years old still talking about what happened to me when I was 12. I said this to my cousin, who though more than a decade younger than me, held traumas just as mature by the time she graduated high school. So did her mother. So did mine. Pain is relative. If you've had a fairly comfortable life, enduring anguish may be more challenging than it is for someone with more experience. I was listening to a podcast where a guest bemoaned the idea of removing children from abusive, unsafe, volatile home environments and placing them in the care of strangers indefinitely. Part of their reasoning centered on resilience and the resourcefulness we gain in learning to navigate difficult circumstances. Basically, the guest hung this argument on the idea that we are more likely to suffer an irrevocable break when we haven't learned to bend. This might be true. Still, it led me to believe that the guest must have been one who had a relatively stable, happy home life because there was no mention of how you break a little more every night when agony consumes most of your days. They didn't speak on how your heart is too busy holding sorrow to save room for joy or on how you are as affected as anyone else. You just keep it inside because you're numb, because you're so tired, because you don't believe anyone would care anyway. You normalize suffering. 
which begets more. And yes, you may bounce back quicker and appear to carry it well because you believe suffering to be inevitable. Because you expect it, you are prepared. Pleasure becomes more shocking than pain. For a while, I was addicted to my story. I didn't want to let it go because I believed it to be crucial to who I am. Now I know. I am not my pain. I am not simply the product of sins committed against me. Neither are you. Thank all that is righteous for this because it means we can exist beyond hurtful circumstances. We can shape hours, then days, soon maybe months, next years, and decades outside the belly of the beast that is past trauma. Akamia Deadweiler, that is beautiful stuff. We are talking with author and motivational speaker and childhood trauma survivor, Akamia Deadweiler. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. We're going to help a lot of people today. You know, I was just talking about uh, uh, Brenda, who emailed me earlier, and and she had some very serious childhood trauma that she overcame. You did, too. And I know in watching a, a Fox uh, television program in Las Vegas, you were on, and you talked about being starved as a child. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Mm -hmm. Well, that particular segment refers to a time when I was about five years old. Uh, my mother, which I didn't know at the time, was suffering from mental illness, and that's what led to the starvation. Um, I'm originally from Indiana, so once that happened, my grandmother came and, you know, stepped in, brought us back to Indiana, and, you know, we went on to live our lives from there. My mother fully recovered. She's fine. She's doing great today. Hasn't had anything like that happen again, thankfully, and we all survived, and we figured out how to make it through. Not only survived, but you're thriving now. You have a master's from Valparaiso University. You have a brand new book coming out later this week on the 15th. And it's called, uh, what, what's the title of the book? It's called Daddy's Little Stranger. I actually have it right here. There <laughs> <So> it is. <laughs> Daddy's Little Stranger will be out on March 15th. Tell us a little bit about Daddy's Little Stranger. Well, Daddy's Little Stranger is about growing up without a father as a girl. And I wrote it because... When I did a search for, you know, what the impact of this might be, everything that returned revolved around female sexuality and being promiscuous and things like that. And I'm sure, you know, these are very researched um, topics and effects. So I'm not saying that it's not a factor, but it's not the only factor and it's not the only outcome. And so I didn't fit into this neat little box of what a fatherless daughter is supposed to look like. And I was like, hey, what about all these other ways that, you know, having not having a father can impact you? And what about all these other things that a father could give to a little girl instead of just always defining women or analyzing women in terms of sexuality? And so I decided to write about that um, from my personal perspective and just things I've witnessed in, in girls who didn't have fathers. Okay, so we've got a little bit of the backstory. Now let's dig into the bones, okay? Um, you are a survivor, and you're not only a survivor from personal standpoint, but from where you grew up, Gary, Indiana, at the time you were growing up was the murder capital of the nation. I'm about to show you guys where I grew up, my hometown. Gary, Indiana, population 74,000, birthplace of Michael Jackson. I spent pretty much all of my adolescence and much of my adult years here until I moved to the West Coast. Um, it's not much here now. That's the train we used to take during the summers to go to Chicago. Chicago is about a 30 minute train ride from here. 2300 Jackson Street. This is the childhood home of Michael Jackson. Look how tiny it is for all those kids. This was the high school I went to. Lou Wallace, the Mighty Hornets. The sad state of affairs now. Mm -hmm. What did you see on a daily basis? that you had to overcome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Gary is absolutely central to my story. 
thankfully, because I had a disciplinarian grandmother and a mother who became um, really invested into religion and church and faith, they shelter me in a in a sense. Like I wasn't allowed to go out and do things. I wasn't hanging out on the street where I could see all these terrible things that were happening. I just kind of heard about them, you know, um, a homecoming football game when I was in high school, like a pregnant student was shot and killed in the head between rival gunfire. Yeah. Um, so of course they weren't shooting at her, but that's how it goes, right? It's the innocent people that pay the price for these, these violent acts. But I wasn't at the football game because I wasn't allowed to, you know, be out there. So at the time, of course, as a kid, I'm upset, like, why can't I do anything? And my friends are there and, you know, I can't stand this. And but they actually protected me from some situations that I probably would have found myself in and not been able to navigate. So I mostly heard about it. I saw, you know, some of it. Um, there were fights and things like that. But for the most part, I wasn't in the places where these you know, murderous and more violent acts were happening. I just knew about them. So when you were being sheltered from this by your grandmother and uh, your mother, what kind of a loving environment were you in then? Mm -hmm. I was in an environment where protection and well-being were the ways that love was demonstrated to me. I wasn't in a very um, affectionate or warm household where, you know, we told each other I loved you, hugged and kissed, like none of that. It was more so like, I'm going to take care of your well-being. I'm going to protect you and I'm going to discipline you. And that's how I show love. So then where does your concept of love and acceptance come from? Mm -hmm. It's something I've had to develop over time. It's so interesting you ask that because I feel like I'm I'm still working on that daily. I've come a very, very long way just through experience and, and acquiring new experiences and interacting with relationships in, in different ways. A lot of it has come from um, my friends, my close friends. I still have the same friends, the same four friends I had in high school. We're very close. You know, we're all spread all over the country now, but we travel for each other's birthdays. They're coming here for my book launch next week. So we're still very close. And I would say they were probably the first to really teach me about warm, affectionate love where, you know, there was a different side of it. And then my niece, my brother had a daughter when he was very young. And so she lived with my mother and I for a time when she was a baby. And it was just this, this unconditional love, the way she would rest her head on my shoulder, the way she would just hug me just because she didn't know any better. She just naturally was like this. And it softened me a lot and helped me get more comfortable with warm or more affectionate displays of love. That's a beautiful story. It, and it reminds me of something that a college psychologist teacher told, told me, and she said, we're the only animal not born with instincts. I always have disagreed with her about that because you're telling me that your niece automatically just laid her head on your shoulder. That's a sign of love and affection. You can't teach that. Can't teach that. That is a natural instinct. And she was a baby, a few months old. No one told her to do that. It was just her natural instinct. So yeah, I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Now, if you're born in uh, solitude and no one ever touches you or 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 anything like that, then I can see how they say, you know, that leads to developmental issues and you never learn that. But when you're in an environment where those opportunities present themselves, it's very much a natural instinct. Well, and nobody teaches us how to cry. We cry automatically. Hey. You know, <laughs> as, as, as we're children, when we're infants, we cry. And nobody they teaches us that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so are you, um? well, before I ask you that question, if you go to your Facebook page and I'm going to put the link up right here and I'm going to share some of these quotes, some of your quotes that you have developed are absolutely beautiful. They're quotes that I'm going to accept and use in my life on a daily basis. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Where does your mind come from to be able to come up with such beautiful prose? You know, I don't know. When I was doing the quotes thing, it was just something that came. To, it started coming to me like every day I would wake up with these ideas for quotes and these ideas that I wanted to communicate and these um, kind of uplifting messages. They were just coming to me. And I think that's how most things happen when you're open to receiving, you know, what you should be doing or or what's meaningful to you. And at that time in my life, it was developing these quotes, you know, every morning. I've I just had like a stash of them. 
And that's how I feel like that's how most of my pros come. I feel like that's when I'm at my best is when I kind of get into, um, I don't know if you heard of flow state Mm -hmm. where, yeah, it's when I kind of get into flow state when I feel like I'm really just tapped in, tuned in to, to my mindset and what I want to communicate. And then the ideas just start flowing to me. And then, you know, I may cultivate them into something more, more tangible or something more readable or digestible, but the idea for what it is just, just kind of comes to me. And I think that comes from just staying immersed um, in the field. Like I read a lot, I write a lot. And it's like when you're doing those and you're constantly letting your brain move with that type of energy, then things start to come to you. Yeah. I mean, it happens for all different kinds of people in all different ways, but yeah, like as a runner, when I'm in flow, it just, everything feels natural. Everything feels good, easy. I'm not thinking about the process. Yeah. That's flow. Yeah, exactly. And then when you're done, you might be like, oh, my knee hurts, but (laughs) (laughs) at the time you're just going and you're not thinking about it. You're just going with the flow, you know, so to speak. Do you have a particular time of day when you're more creative than others? You know, it's changed for me. It used to be the nighttime. I used to be a night out, someone who stayed up to two, three in the morning writing and being creative because that's when my ideas started to flow. I used to be a big wine drinker. So I would come home, I would pour a glass of wine and then, yeah, I have all these ideas and I feel like, oh, I'm a better writer when I've drank wine. But (laughs) now it's kind of flipped. Um, Coffee really does it for me. Um, I'll go to a coffee shop in the morning and that caffeine really helps me focus and, you know, it gets my brain working. So I would say now it's maybe midday, like between the hours of 11 and four, where I feel the most creative. And how long did it take you to write Daddy's Little Stranger? It took me... It took me a couple of years because it started out completely different. At first, it was a collection of essays. And then when I signed with a publisher, the publisher read it and was like, I'm not going to tell you what to do with your book, but I really think this would work better as a cohesive story if you just move some things around and develop, you know, connecting threads. I really think this is a powerful story and you don't have to break it up into essays. And he was right. You know, I went back through and read it and I was like, wow, yeah, this could go here and I could expand on this here and just really developed a cohesive story. How proud is your mom? She's very proud. You know, she's very proud. Everyone, you know, heals and reconciles differently. So she doesn't really like to talk about things that we may have endured or things that she has been through. And I respect that. You know, that's her story to tell. I'll only speak on the parts that affected me or how they affected me. But yeah, she's doing very well. She just and that's how she copes is she's forgiven herself and she's moved on and 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 that's her thing. And she doesn't like to talk about it. And I respect that. Kind of goes back to what you said at the very beginning, where you started the quote with, I don't want to be talking about my story when I'm 60. Mm-hmm. But here we are still talking about your story. So how has the story changed so mm-hmm. that you're able to talk about it in your 40s, 50s, 60s? Mm, that's a great question. The story has changed in the sense that I now speak about it from a place of love. Like when I was first, when I was very, very young, I wrote a memoir. It's out of print now. So please, like no one try to find it. It's out of print for good reason. Like <laughs> the <laughs> right kind of cringeworthy. And, and also when I wrote it initially, it was more like a revenge tour. It was like, I'm going to tell everything you did to me. I'm going to tell everything that happened to me. And I had no regard for for making like these people in my life full body characters or full body people. I had no grace for what they may have been going through as people. It was all about, this is what you did and it's so terrible. And so now I'm at a place where even with my father with Daddy's Little Stranger, which is about growing up, not knowing him and not having him in my life, I still find areas where I can show him some grace and say like, hey, I don't know where you've been and what you've been through, but I'm sure it was something, you know, to keep a father from his child. And so I think that's where it's changed, where I'm not, there is no vindictiveness in my approach there. Um, There is intentionally love and grace and understanding as far as I can pull it. Yeah. So it sounds to me like the story has maybe changed from a vengeful story to one of sympathy and forgiveness. Exactly. Exactly. And, And a story now of, I've healed and here's how I healed and here's who I am now instead of holding on to that idea of who I was and the things that happened to me. 
is the healing process ongoing or is there a time where you're fully healed and you don't have to worry about it anymore? It's ongoing. It's ongoing because I may feel like I'm fully healed and I don't have to worry about it. And then something will happen and I'll slip back into old habits, <laughs> whether that's, you know, kind of uh, resisting vulnerability or like maybe ending a relationship because I'm afraid that it's going to end anyway, kind of a little bit of abandonment um, fears and, and things like that. So sometimes I have to catch myself and I consciously go against what my natural instinct is to do. Do you think as, because you mentioned very at the very beginning, it happened to your grandmother, it happened to your mother. Do you think you're the end of the cycle? Is that a role that you are accepting? Mm -hmm. I hope I'm the end of the cycle. That is my intent to be the end of the cycle. I'm always, those who are, you know, receptive to it, I'm always talking about not holding on to these hurtful, traumatic stories that weigh us down. Like, yeah, if it happened, it happened. If it hurts you, it hurts you. If it affects you, it affects you. But I also want us to be cognizant of looking toward the people we want to become and looking toward healing and how we can not just continue to regurgitate that story and talk about how it's affected us, but learn to get over it. And I think a lot of times we resist that because we don't know who we are outside of that story. It's been so influential in our lives. We don't know who we would be if we didn't tell people like, well, this happened to me. And so it made me this way. And it's about learning who you are outside of that situation and who you can become later on. Okay. There's like three questions in there to unravel. All right. That's a beautiful answer. So how do you not harbor a grudge against somebody who has wronged you? I am terrible at it. I, oh my God, I'm terrible at it. Oh yeah. yeah. It's very difficult. It's not something that I think, again, talking about natural instincts, I don't think our natural instinct is to let people off the hook once they've hurt us or, or let go of that grudge is very hard. I, I struggle with resentment for a very long time, you know, without even knowing it because I wasn't actively like, oh, I hate this person. But I know I held resentment in my heart because I couldn't think about them. I couldn't speak about them without saying something negative or harboring kind of like a sour attitude whenever they try to talk to me or being short, you know? So it kind of resonates in those ways. Even if you don't know you're actively holding a grudge, it's I was holding on to resentment that manifested in those ways where I was just kind of, you know, cold towards the person. But I learned to start letting go because I realized that forgiveness and letting go isn't for that person. It's for me, you know, it's for you. It doesn't feel good to hold a grudge against someone. It doesn't feel good to harbor that resentment. Nothing about it has you like, oh, I feel so great hating this person, you know? So it's like, you think about, I want to heal. I want to be a full person. I want to live a full life. And you just kind of learn how to forgive and let go and move on for your benefit. Not thinking that you're letting that person off the hook. You're just releasing yourself from the burden of carrying what they did to you. Uh, good. I have a good friend named Joe Martinez. I did a recent conversation with him and he's a, a boxing cage announcer and ring announcer and all that kind of stuff. And he said, do you realize the amount of energy it takes to hate mm -hmm. over the amount of energy it takes to love? He goes, exactly. It's night and day. He says, you're killing yourself if you hold on, hold on to this hate. Exactly. Exactly. And there's a middle ground. Like I'm not, I'm not a doormat or anything like that. If you've wronged me, you, you probably won't get that type of access to me again. <laughs> so I'm not that type where I'm like, Oh, let me, let me let you hurt me again. I'm not on that level, but there's a space in between where it's like, I'm not holding any animosity towards you, towards this situation. I wish you well, but I'm going to live in this space where I am free you know, and it doesn't affect my ability to love and care for and not just other people, but myself. That was one of my questions. How do you overcome? How do you let it go and not become a doormat? How do you mm -hmm. not get taken advantage of? Mm -hmm. People see you as weak. Yeah. You stay in that space between. I mean, you remind yourself that this isn't for them. It's for me. And just because you forgive someone doesn't mean you maintain the relationship. Those two things are not, you know, they don't have to go together. They're not married. I can forgive you and decide I don't want you in my life. That doesn't mean I'm harboring resentment. It just means I don't believe this relationship is good for me. So I think that's how you do it. But I'm not angry with you. I hold no animosity. If you're if you're on fire, I'll put the fire. I'll help put the fire out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I'm not going to, you know, go out of my way to maintain any sense of relationship and I may flat out 
tell you that I don't think we should maintain a relationship. So I think that's how you do it. You don't have don't think because you forgive someone or because you let things go that they did to you. Don't think that means they have to stay in your life because they don't. Akamia Deadweiler is my guest. She's a childhood trauma survivor, and she is the author of the upcoming book, Daddy's Little Stranger. I want to go back to something you just said right there, and it's uh, from a post that you made on December 4th, 2023. It's on your blog, As We Heal. And you say in the blog, sometimes taking a break from situations, from people, is a good thing, whether it's a family member or a coworker. So when you take that break, how do you bring that person back in? Mm -hmm. I think it happens organically if it's supposed to happen. Like I never force relationships. I never force reconciliations. Um, I never force connections. I think it happens organically. But if I take a break from a situation or a person and I start to miss them in healthy ways, not in like the ways that are like, oh, I feel like there's a hole in me without this person, because sometimes that hole can be toxicity or trauma, you know, or trauma bond, it doesn't necessarily mean that person is good for you. You're just used to having them in your life. You're comfortable with them. But if I take a break from a situation or a person and then I realize like, hey, I'm I'm happier with this person in my life or I feel better in this situation, then I'm open to reconciliation or going back to it. And I think it it happens naturally and organically. You don't have to force it. What do you think about this quote? I don't forgive. I don't forget. I just move on. Mm. That's what I told my mom. Mm. Wow. I like it. I like it because sometimes that's all you can do. You yeah. know, depending on how deeply someone has wounded you, you may not be able to forgive them, even if it's for your own benefit. But moving on in and of itself and not continually revisiting them or that situation is still beneficial because you, you know, you open yourself up to greater possibilities and you can bring in more love when you're not constantly in the face of that situation that makes you feel that way. And my, my thought behind that is that if time heals all wounds, it'll work itself out. Exactly. Exactly. You don't have to do anything. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, and you were talking about uh, the, the toxicity of a person leaving a hole in the opening uh, uh, monologue that you had. Um, you were talking about sometimes we think that's what we deserve. We don't think we deserve love. We don't think we deserve praise. Mm -hmm. How do you get over that thought? Because I harbor that thought. I don't think I'm ever good enough. It's tough, especially if it was ingrained in you that you weren't good enough. <laughs> and, you started, <laughs> and you started to harbor that idea. It's tough, but you have to. I read a lot of books. Um, early when I as an early reader, I read a lot of self-help books and self and psychology books. Now, as a writer, I read more like literary books, like memoirs and fiction and creative works. But before I was heavy on like self-help and philosophy, and those books have helped me a lot. I always recommend The Four Agreements. Um, it's been life-changing for me. Um, the Emotionally Absent Mother was another book that helped me and could also help anyone who has issues with their mother or disconnect there or harboring any type of, you know, negative feelings. It talks all about how it affects you and what it did to you. And I think that understanding is helpful because then you don't just think like, oh, I'm not good enough or I'm this and that. You start to see the patterns and what made you start to think that about yourself. And then once you see that, you can start to unravel it. You can peel back those layers and then consciously act as though you are good enough. And I think when you make those conscious decisions like like how I said before, going against my natural instinct to pull away or something like that. When you make the conscious decision to act against your natural instincts, I think soon the decision starts to become subconscious. You don't have to think about it. In the beginning, it'll have to be a conscious decision like I'm willfully doing this against what I want to do or how I feel. And then if you do that enough, those behaviors and reactions will start to come sub start to become subconscious. Uh, because the brain is a muscle. And it takes just a certain amount of time to retrain a muscle or to train a muscle. And so that's basically what we, we, what we would be doing with our thought process. Exactly. Exactly. It is. It is very much a muscle. And if you keep telling it, I'm going to go, I'm going to start this podcast and it's going to be good. And I know I'm good enough to do this. If you keep telling yourself that and you keep doing it. Eventually your brain will, it'll adjust, it'll adapt and it'll say, okay, I guess we're good enough for this, you know? So it just takes some learning why you're that way so you can unravel it and then consciously acting against that.
Well, I'm reading a quote from you right now. There is no more powerful tool at our disposal than our minds. And I read that the other day and it got me thinking about, I'm, I'm going through physical therapy because as a runner, I pulled a muscle. Yeah, you know, I strained a calf muscle. And so I'm going to physical therapy. And before we even started correcting problems, the physical therapist had to identify the problems. And he said, here's what's going on. He says, your body, your mind has decided that this is your running style. And so this is how we have to compensate. He said, your mind is what's pro causing the problem because it's so used to running this way that yeah. it hasn't figured out how to adapt yet. That's what we have to teach it. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really interesting, but it makes a lot of sense. You have to teach your brain. Okay. We run this way now because we don't want to get hurt. So. Exactly. Yeah. And then after a while of doing it, you know, running that way, then eventually it'll, it'll know it is kind of a muscle memory, a brain memory. It'll know like, okay, we run this way now, but it's going to take some, you know, conscious effort to train it. And on an emotional level, what we're talking about is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you let your brain think that way, if you've been told this way and you let your brain think that way, of course your brain's going to think that way. Of course, because you've told it that it's definitely a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I wake up every day and say, oh, I'm going to... I'm going to trip over the corner of my bed every single morning. I probably will because I'm telling myself I'm going to do that. Like we really don't understand, I think, how powerful our, our mind is. And what you tell yourself is what you will believe and you will bring that to fruition. You'll make it happen somehow, some way. Even if you don't think you're doing it, you're going to make it happen. We were talking about quotes earlier. What is your favorite quote, whether it's come from you or whether it's one that you've read? Wow, that's a, that's a great question because I love quotes. I know you um, do. <laughs> <laughs> right, I won't I won't pick choose my own. Um, Why not? <laughs> because I'll let other people have those and choose their favorites. There, I'll be I'll be less um, self self involved. My favorite quote is from Rumi, where it says um, it says something like, "Well, it says your task is not to seek for love, but to merely." find all the barriers in yourself that you have built against it or remove all the barriers. So your task is not to seek for love, but to merely find and remove all the barriers that you have built against it. That's my favorite quote. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of when you're looking for love, you're not going to find it when, in relationships, you know, but when it happens, you know. Yeah, exactly. And it's a testament to how we were talking about natural instincts, how our natural instinct is to love and care and nurture. And that only doesn't happen when we've put something in the way. Mm -hmm. you know, it only doesn't happen when we have a barrier there. So if we focus on removing those barriers, that love will naturally come in and flow out because we don't have anything standing in its way. So it's not necessarily about finding love or finding, you know, love that you can receive or how to give it. It's just Take the barriers out and love will do what it's supposed to do, which is to flow in and out of you. Is love universal or is there a different definition for everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a universal idea of love. The details may be different for everyone. Like how you receive love may be different. Like um, if you've heard of the five love languages. Yeah, yeah, huh? I do believe that like the way I receive love may not be the way you receive love. You may need to be told I love you every day, whereas I may need my partner to come set up a bookshelf for me. And that tells me, oh, he loves me, you know, because he did this. Yeah. So I do think the way we receive love can be different. But universally, I think, you know, love is pure. Love is patient. Love is kind. I do believe in that universal def universal definition. But the way you receive it can be different you're smart thank you so much for that that was awesome oh, so cool you. i love to think about love i know you do and and you, <laughs> that, that leads me to your podcast why haven't you done a love lines recently i have actually um the last one i saw was 2023 oh for the newsletter but what about where you took lyrics of a song like india re and you dissect that into how it pertains to your life and how it pertains to other people's lives. That's the aspect that I was talking about. That's that was incredible. 
Well, because I know music is a big part of your life. You call yourself a music snob. I want that definition. <laughs> what? Wh where does that come from? What's that definition? I am a music snob. Just, just, it just means I'm very particular about music. The same thing with like a wine connoisseur. Like if if you give me a cheap wine, I'll I'll know <laughs> just because I've been a wine drinker and it won't appeal to my taste buds because you know wine is an acquired taste. Mm -hmm. And so it won't appeal to what I've grown accustomed to. And it's the same thing with music. Like I, have, I grew up in a musical household, like everyone in my family can sing. They're in choirs and have recorded albums and, and things like that. So I was very snobbish about music from an early age and just appreciating real music, so to speak, you know. So that's that's just what it means. I'm very particular about what I listen to. How much did music help you escape your traumatic upbringing? Oh, it helped a lot. Um, I mark in Daddy's Little Stranger, I talk about um, a time when I got a Sony Discman for Christmas. Nice. Um, I got a Walkman first, of course, because, you know, that was a progression. Yeah. That opened me up to like a whole nother world because growing up in a religious family, although we were musical, I only listened to gospel. Like I only listened to gospel music. And then once I got my Walkman and my Discman, I started listening to, you know, the secular music stations where these people were talking about pain and heartbreak and love and feeling alone and and things like that and singing about that and I was just like oh my gosh so when I got older I started filling out those little cards for like um Columbia Music House and oh Penny. yeah <laughs> right <laughs> where you got the 12 CDs for a penny or something like yep. that and so I started ordering CDs and one of my first ones was Whitney Houston um and her voice of course her voice is just amazing and it just blew me away and then I saw the bodyguard and I was like oh my gosh she's gorgeous so I would literally like sit and listen to Whitney Houston on my headphones just have her albums on repeat and I used to you know before I have a much better relationship with my mother now um but back then when we were kind of disconnected I used to like I feel funny even saying this now as an adult but as a child I used to kind of like fantasize about her being my mother and just loving me and caring for me so music was a great escape for me the way it just it gave me something to identify with where the answer wasn't just strictly pray about it or you know let's go to church it was like these people really they feel how I feel and they're singing about this and it just really helped me feel seen well, one of the seminal music moments that I think you talk about, I, at least I've read this anyway, and I think it's seminal, is a TLC concert in Gary, Indiana. That changed you. It did change me. It did change me. Um, it was my first concert. It was an outdoor festival, and TLC was one of the acts. This was early TLC, so they weren't the huge group that they went on to become. And they, you could just tell they were just so happy to be there. And they were defiant and they wore baggy clothes and they wore condoms on their eyeglasses and they were just, ju they were loud. They were everything, you know, that I wasn't and, and showed me, you know, this exuberance, this joy that you could have as a young woman. Still a memorable experience. <laughs> Still, for sure. Absolutely. I just wrote an essay about that. And it's also in, in Daddy's Little Stranger, the essay that you read, mm -hmm. it's a book, so. Well, my wife and I often uh, quote uh, TLC because uh, we'll ask each other, you know, hey, do you want to go here? And she'll be like, I don't want. And I'm like, what? No scrub. No scrub. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's it's funny when it's all in fun, when you know that, you know, yeah. it's all fun, it's all playful. Then it's funny. It's not offensive. <laughs> not hilarious. offensive at all. Not offensive at all. Um <laughs> Why, why you, in the uh, in the for those who have had a rough year, you talk about getting rid of social media. Why do we let negativity bury anything positive? Because I'm guilty of that. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know how much of it is letting it, and how much of it is just that negativity is so powerful and resonant that if we consume too much of it, it just naturally overshadows everything else. So that's been kind of my solution and approach is to limit the negativity that I intake. Like I don't watch the news. Um, I try to avoid the news on social media and Twitter unless it's something really going on that I really want to know about because 95% of it is negative. Mm -hmm. And if that's all I'm seeing, then that's how I'm going to see the world. Like, So then when a couple positive things come through, 
It's like, it doesn't mean anything because I've already seen 20 negative things, you know, so it's hard to measure up against it. And it kind of, it actually shapes your view of the world and how you see things and how you see people. And that's very difficult to overcome. So I address it by limiting the negativity and consuming more positivity than negativity. So then when I do see a couple of negative things, it can't, it can't overpower the positivity. It can't, you know, crush it because I already have so much more of it than the negative that I'm, you know, ingesting. Well, the negativity and positivity that you just talked about kind of leads me to what you do voluntarily. And you, you volunteer with Boys and Girls Club with, with uh, at-risk uh, at risk youth um, and negative situations that are trying to be or hopefully will be turned into positives. How rewarding is it to connect with an at-risk youth? It's very rewarding. It's very rewarding. Every year I was doing um, Girls Day at the Boys and Girls Club. <clears throat> I think they stopped doing it when the pandemic happened, just because, you know, we weren't allowed to be in club quarters. And they just started doing it again. So I'll be there again this year. But um, I was doing Girls Day every year where you go and they match you up with an at-risk little girl they also have a uh, guys night out or something boys night out or something where they do the same thing with men and boys they match you with an at-risk youth and you just spend the day together we play games we eat we do competitions where we have to work together we talk and it is it's very rewarding especially at the end when like the little girls will run up and give me a hug and they're so happy and it, it just reminds you of how it doesn't take much to impact someone's life especially a child like it doesn't take much at all to to give them help them have a good day and make them happy and give them a little bit of fun so it's very rewarding to think that i made an impact on someone even if just for a day so i will use the those children that you work with as the backdrop but in an overall sense how important is it for the people to know that somebody cares I think it's very important. Like we all need to know somebody cares. And you know, I've gone through I've gone through stages where I felt like, well, I don't need anyone and I don't I don't I don't even need love. Like I don't care. I'm fine alone. And so, you know, we go through that, but that's not that's not true. Like we all need to know someone cares. We all need to feel like someone cares. We feel better knowing that someone cares. And it helps you keep a hold of yourself. Like when you're especially for a child, like if, if you feel like no one cares about you and no one cares what you do, it, it's difficult for you to care about yourself. You don't think that your actions are consequential and you kind of feel like, why do this? Who cares anyway? Or why not harm myself in this way? No one cares. You know, no one's going to miss me. You know, no one loves me. So it definitely has a huge impact on the way you see yourself and, and the choices that you make. And my experience in 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 volunteering is what you give, you get back tenfold. Exactly. Exactly. You really do. You really do. So mm -hmm. how, uh, when you look back on where you've come from, how surprised are you at the success you've had <clears throat> and where you are in life? If I actually like stop and look back, I would be, I am very surprised because at first I feel like I'm just, a completely different person from who I used to be and the way I used to see myself. And, and that's not always something that we see or something that we believe is possible. We kind of go through life saying, you know, this is who I am. This is just how I am. So for me to kind of, kind of have tra transformed myself in a sense to where now I am confident in my ability and my skill. I've always been an achiever because my grandmother was a disciplinarian. She she wasn't playing that. I had to make the honor roll. <laughs> I had to do bring home good grades. I had to be the best at everything. So I've always been an achiever. So I did have that. But it's more so the finding my voice, like, and and seeing myself outside of this idea of perfectionism and understanding that even if I wasn't perfect, even if I made the B on a row instead of the A on a row, I was still good enough and I was still deserving of love and attention. So I, I'm very proud of where I came, probably even more so than a professional sense in a personal sense, mm -hmm. because I am because I have been able to kind of overcome things that I've been through and 
forgive people and our hold this these grudges and this these this resentment. I'm most proud of that because of how it's transformed me as a person. I'm a much happier person, a much more content person than I was when I had all this turmoil going around. But I am also proud of my achievements and my accomplishments and how I was able to how I am able to excel at something I actually love, which is writing. Uh, you talked about grandma being uh, somebody who expected you to overachieve. How did she take your basketball career? <laughs> See ya, Michael Jordan. You know what? She was actually excited about that because we grew up watching, growing up in the Chicago area, we grew up watching the 90s Chicago Bulls. Uh -huh. They were just the best team in the league and just dominant. Like best we've team never in the world. Best team in the world. We've never seen any anyone like them before or after. Maybe the Warriors have gotten closest when they had that run and they went seventy two and ten one year. But we've never we've never seen anyone like Michael Jordan. We've uh -uh. never seen a team as dominant as that team. So that was one of our you know moments of joy where we gather around her floor model, her floor model television and watch the Chicago Bulls and she would just rave about how good Michael Jordan was and she loved Scotty and then we got Rodman and it was just like wow this is amazing. So she actually loved basketball because we grew up in that Chicago Bulls area and we would watch games, you know, as a family. So she was excited you know, about my basketball career, she would ask about it. By that time, um, she was older, slowing down, so she didn't come to my games or anything like that, but she was very excited and would ask about it. But when you tried out, you didn't initially make the team, correct? I didn't make the team. Yeah. I showed up, yeah, <laughs> I showed up thinking, like, I can play, I'm going to make the team, because I was playing, and this was based on playing in the driveway with my brother every day, or my cousin, and I was, I would beat them, so I was like, I'm good, I'm going to go play basketball at college, <laughs> not really realizing that that's a whole other world, a whole other system, it's not at all like street ball or pickup ball, I was out of shape. So I couldn't, we had to run a mile and I couldn't, I couldn't lift weights. I couldn't do anything except shoot the basketball. And so, yeah, the coach cut me, but that actually like motivated me to get in shape. Like I spent that entire summer just getting into basketball shape and understanding where I needed to be in the next, the next tryout I went and I was actually like beating people when we ran the mile and all of that. And I, and I made the team and that, that's probably one of like my proudest moments. The fact that I, didn't achieve my goal. I was cut, but then I worked hard and came back and got it the next time. Personally, I think that probably goes back to your upbringing and, and, and because we're always presented with paths, okay? Forks in the road, okay? And if you would have uh, stayed on the path of the traumatic experiences that you had, you probably would have never, well, you wouldn't have overcome it. And number two, you wouldn't have made the basketball team, but because you chose the other path of, yeah, that's what I've overcome. Now I know what I'm dealing with. I'm going to, I'm going to make that team. You, you became, you became a fighter. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. If I would have stayed on that path and kind of fallen into despair, I would have never believed I could achieve anything like that. I would have never believed I could do anything like that. Being cut would have crushed me mm -hmm. and I would have never pursued anything else again, you know, and just probably went into this dark space in my head about how, you know, I'm a loser and I can't do this. But I, I agree, since I did choose the other path, it helped fuel that motivation to say, no, I can do this and I'm going to do this. So is overcoming your childhood your biggest motivation? Not at this point. Not at this point. Um, It was it was then and early, early in my life. And then as I got older and started to even realize how it had affected me, because for a while I didn't think it affected me. I was like, I'm fine. You know, I'm happy. I joke. I'm funny. You know, I have a good life, but once I started to see the ways that it, that it affected me and how it affected my ability to connect with people and receive love and give love, and I started to really unravel that, um, that's when I realized how just even not having my father, how that affected the child version of me and how that child is still inside of me making decisions, you know, <laughs> and thinking thoughts. And so addressing that um, helped me become who I am today. So for a while, I didn't think it affected me at all. So, but early, once I started to see the effects, it was a motivating factor. But at this point, I feel like I've 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 done a good job of creating this adult version of me who isn't 
stifled or burdened by the child and what happened to her. So it's not as much of a motivating factor now as it once was. So what motivates you going forward? What motivates me going forward is just being the best version of myself and being the best version that I want to be. So if I want to be this person who is kind and loving and offers grace and has empathy and is driven and is determined and and confident in all these things, it's about nurturing this person that I see myself as now and being the best version of those things. And it's easy to do. Uh, because of where you've come from. See, what I, what I mean by that is you've seen how not to do it. Mm-hmm. So now you can see, now you know how to do it, you know? Yeah. I say that all the time. Like I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of data on what <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say that all the time. I have a lot of data on what not to do, and it's helped me learn what to do. It's helped me learn who I want to be. It's helped me learn what I want to see happen in my life and the decisions that I want to make because I don't want to be here and I don't want to experience this and I don't want to inflict this type of pain on anyone. So definitely like learning what I don't want has taught me, you know, what not to do, which gives me the other side of what to do. Exactly. What what you don't want to lead you to what you do want. Exactly. Where, where where can we get the book? Daddy's Little Stranger. The book will be available wherever you order your books. Um, Amazon, Bookshop, Barnes and Noble. If you want to order from your local bookstore, they'll be able to order it. It's, you, it's nationally distributed through a traditional publisher, so you can order it anywhere you order your books. Well, we're looking forward to reading the book. Congratulations on all of your success. You're just, as I mentioned uh, the other day, I spent five hours with you researching you and, and hopefully that, uh, hopefully you got that uh, impression, but I love everything about you. I really did. Thank you so much. I really have appreciated this conversation. Man, I enjoyed that. And I hope you did too. My thanks to Akamia Deadweiler for joining me. Akamia's book, Daddy's Little Stranger, is out on March 15th and it's available online and at bookstores nationwide. Should you know someone who could benefit from hearing Akamia's story and advice? Please, by all means, tell them about the episode. If you would be so kind, sure could use more likes, reviews, ratings, and subscribers. Growing the audience, well, what that does, it allows me to continue attracting and booking quality and helpful guests like Akamia. Thank you in advance for doing that. The Fuzzy Mic is hosted by Kevin Klein. Production elements by Zach Sheesh at the Radio Farm. Social media director is Trish Klein. For a dose of laughter and unpredictability, please listen to the Tuttle and Klein podcast with new episodes every Wednesday. I'll be back next Tuesday with an all new episode of the Fuzzy Mike. Thank you for listening and for sharing your invaluable time with the Fuzzy Mike. I'm grateful. That's it for the Fuzzy Mike. Thank you. The Fuzzy Mike with Kevin Klein. Fuzzy Mike.